Okay, good evening everybody. It's really good to, uh, to have everyone joining us this evening. Um, I'm gonna mute everyone. I think I have the ability to do that. Uh, hold on one second. No, no. Okay. Okay, um, I've muted everyone. So that means if you wanna speak, if you have something, a question to share um, or a comment, um, I would ask you to unmute yourself um, and talk, or if for some reason you can't hear, um, or if the feed goes out and, and we disappear, um, just let us know. Um, it's really, it's really a, a, a big privilege um, for us to be able to learn together tonight. Um, it's very exciting to uh, take a few minutes out this week um, from all the craziness of Erev Pesach um, to be able to pause for a moment. I'm very grateful to Rabbi Moulton, um, my rabbinic colleague in Baltimore, um, who's also taking some time out, although um, I think he's going away for the first days of Pesach. So I don't know how he arranged that, <laughs> um, but um, I don't feel so bad uh, since, since you're taking a little bit of vacation. You still have that, so. <laughs> we'll, we'll, do some kind of pro, we'll do some kind of Pesach program right. together. Um, the goal for this evening is very simple. The goal for this evening is, in a couple of days, um, we will all need to perform um, the one time where everyone in Kali Israel is required to participate, um, all the Jewish people throughout the world um, are required to contribute uh, to some kind of religious ceremony, um, is the Seder, um, is uh, that, that wonderful evening together around the family table where we get to share the story of Egypt. Um, and it's a great opportunity to impress your, your, your parents, your siblings, your kids, um, your friends, um, whomever you may be having Seder with. Um, it's a good opportunity to show um, all the preparation you've done, not only in, in food and, uh, and singing, uh, but also in ideas. So the thought is, um, over the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to share um, some ideas on how to run a Seder, um, some Debray Torah, um, and some resources um, that will hopefully enhance your ability uh, to make the Seder a really, really fun evening. Um, Rabbi Milton and I are going to more or less switch off um, and uh, maybe comment or ask questions or whatever on each other's ideas. Um, additionally, I just want to make, make everyone aware that on our website, pikesilljewish.com, um, there are also other resources. Um, I posted some links there um, and a Pesach bingo game um, for your Seder. Um, there's like 15 different uh, cards for Pesach bingo. Um, so I re recommend checking that out. Um, and additionally, um, I posted a, a, about 20 to 25 short ideas on different parts of the Seder, um, one paragraph or less each idea. Um, so check that out. Um, some of them are repeated, will, will be repeated tonight, um, but that's a, it's a great cheat sheet uh, to keep under your, uh, your matzah. Um, so anytime you want to sound intelligent, um, you have uh, something to share. Um, we're going to kick off <clears throat> straight away. Uh, we're going we're gonna to try and structure this around um, the Seder itself. Um, we're going to go through some of the steps in the Seder and share brief ideas. Um, and if anyone has any questions, you can write it in the chat or you can unmute, unmute yourself and uh, don't be shy. Talk up. Uh, we're amongst our uh, 22 nearest and dearest friends. Okay, um, before I start, well, no, I'm going to start with two very quick ideas and then I'm going to ask Rabbi Moten to share. Um, I want to start off with, the, uh, uh, with a discussion about Kaddish. Uh, we begin the Seder uh, with making Kiddush, which is how we begin everything. Um, right? We begin Shabbos by making Kiddush, we begin Yom Tov by making Kiddush. Um, and uh, the, the more fundamental question that comes out on the Seder this, in general is wine plays a very, very central role. Obviously, we have four cups of wine, um, and we start off the entire evening um, with sanctifying the day over the wine um, and bringing our focus um, onto, uh, onto the wine or grape juice that we'll drink. One of the suggestions as to why we use wine in particular for um, ceremonial um, or sanctification processes um, is because wine is one of the few foods that get better over age. Um, as, as you wait, as you have a fine bottle of wine, um, as the years pass, um, apparently it only, I'm not a big, I was gonna say I'm not, I'm not a big alcoholic, um, but I'm not a, a, a big wine enthusiast. Um, but as you wait, as, as time passes, wine becomes finer, um, it becomes more tasty, there's more uh, different flavors as it ages, 
Um, and the suggestion is perhaps with each cup on the Seder night, our appreciation for our freedom grows, um, or, or alternatively with each Shabbat, with each Pesach, with each Sukkot that we uh, celebrate, um, we are supposed to grow um, in our connection to God, our connection to each other, and we're supposed to age well like a fine wine. That leads me to one other idea, um, and then to, to Rabbi Motsen. Um, the first two steps in the Haggadah, so that's idea number one. Why wine? Because it ages well, um, and I hope we age well too. Um, idea number two. We do two things initially um, before we start all the dipping and all the sharing and all the stories. We do Kadesh and then we do Orchat. So Kadesh is making Kiddush and Orchat is washing our hands without any bracha. Uh, in my family, only the, the person leading the Seder washes the hands, um, but that, that uh, a lot of people think that's weird. Um, I think in America, everyone washes their hands. It's like equal opportunity washing. Um, but um, so the question is, usually we do, we, we wash our hands before we do anything ceremony, ceremonial. Definitely the Kohanim and the Beit HaMikdash and the Temple, they wash their hands before they did any ceremony. Um, and if we're trying to do something special, um, if we're trying to have a special evening, um, we should wash our hands first, get rid of all the impurities, um, and then we should do Kiddush, then we should start off the evening um, and the, the ceremony um, that ensues. So the suggestion um, I want to make is that there's a difference between Kadesh and Orchatz that requires Kadesh to be first. Why? Kadesh is a national sanctification. What we're about to do at the Seder is we're about to do a private storytelling of ETS and Try. We're about to sit around at the table with our family, listen to kids sing Manishkana and sing our songs and make animal sounds sometimes and, and do all the crazy things and all the nuances that our fam each of our families have. Um, and, and it's gonna be very personal. It's, very, it's a personal sanctification. Before you sanctify yourselves, before you have that special experience privately and personally, you have to start off by recognizing that you're part of something much, much bigger. And that's why we start with Kaddish. Kaddish is a national sanctification. The recognition that the day is established as a national holiday, it's, com it's to commemorate Zechel Letzias and Tzrayim, it's to commemorate the Exodus from Egypt. And therefore, before we wash our own hands and we sanctify ourselves personally, we start off Kadesh before Orchas. We start off with the national sanctification, and then we sanctify ourselves personally. Before I um, hand over to Rabbi Moten, I'm just going to adjust the camera for a second because it's getting a little fuzzy. So hold on one second. Excuse my fingers. I want to make sure we can all see Rabbi Moten. Rabbi Moten is a dear colleague, um, a good friend, um, and the rabbi of Ner um, and he. Uh, he does awesome and wonderful programming, um, including, I think he just brought out four or five hundred people um, to, uh, to hear from Judge Ricky Fryer, who's a uh, Hasidic um, uh, judge in Brooklyn. Um, he's doing really creative and great stuff, so it's well worth paying attention to him and well worth paying attention to the show. One other thing that's very relevant to a lot of people in our community is Rabbi Moten is a very popular teacher at BT, at Beth Tefillah. Um, and uh, in Mir Tashem, many kids in our community will benefit uh, from his charisma and, uh, and teaching. Before Rabbi Motsen uh, shares his Dvar Torah, or his thought, um, I asked him to share with everyone a, a, a favorite or an earliest memory of the Seder. Yeah, this was a tough question. First of all, it's just an absolute honor to be here. Thank you, Rabbi Shaffer. This is a phenomenal idea. I really love this. Um, it's amazing that people are taking time out of their schedule, a few hours before Pesach, quite literally to learn some different Torah on the Seder and just have a chance to prepare properly. It's really uh, it's an amazing and creative idea. And thank you. It's wonderful to be here. So thank you. Thank you, thank you for, for having me. <sighs> a memory. Uh, I, I nothing Pesach, big. Nothing big. I love Pesach. I really do. I actually, as you asked me that question, I quickly grabbed my phone and I decided to do a lifeline over here. Is that allowed? Yeah. It's okay, okay, cool. So, no so my, my wife reminded me of my favorite memory. <laughs> thank you, wife. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hindi. Um, but really, um, I love Pesach. My birthday is on Pesach. A lot of good things happen on Pesach. Thank you. And the one thing which I probably mention to my family the most. Okay, I am told to speak up. So the memory that I speak of the most to my family is my grandfather, Ella Bashalom, was a Holocaust survivor. Um, after the war, after spending time in Auschwitz, he made his way to Israel in 19, and right after right after the Holocaust, and he had children, one of those children 
unfortunately died as a soldier in the IDF in Yom Tov. And one Yom Tov, I believe this was Pesach, hearing he makes him say Kiddush and say Shekhi And here's a man who rightfully had many reasons to complain, many things that he could have turned to God with and said, why me? Why my family? What did you do to me? And instead, he, with the most emotion I've ever seen in my life, was able to say, thanking God for allowing him to live, to be here, to exist. Uh, every time I say, every Yom it really just, just hits me. I'm, I'm getting emotional thinking about it right now. Um, so that is how we start our Seder, obviously, with Shachiyanu, and that is by far the most powerful memory I get of this act. I ask, the reason I ask is because um, it, it's a little contrived, um, and certainly your memory is not contrived, but um, Seder night is, is, is the first night um, in our calendar to make memories for the children in the room. Um, and one of, the, one of the things I think is worth spending time thinking about is what are you going to do? Um, you know, fewer and fewer people um, have that kind of memory. Um, so what are we going to do on Seder night to um, create those uh, almost idiosyncrasies that the kids, uh, the kids, the children will remember. Okay, right. Rabbi Moulton is going to speak. So Rabbi Shaffer, I have a question for you now. Yeah. Okay, and the question for you is potatoes or celery? Potatoes. Potatoes. Oh, I'm a potatoes. I think my I think okay. my my mom is is um, calling in. She's my hello, my Mr. Number one, my, my number one fan, um, and she always uh, growing up, she always used to sneak me like tons and tons of potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm particularly in the salt water. Awesome. I love the potatoes. This is like the Jewish equivalent of boxer of roots. You know that, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so anyway, I'm a potato guy um, as well. And yeah. the carpus is a, is a funny one. It's a challenging part of the Seder. It's what we do after we wash our hands. We dip a vegetable. Some people take potato, some celery, some parsley. Uh, the the tights of Rabbi Tights in Elizabeth, very well known. Their customers take bananas. Bananas. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Okay. So, just like they did in Europe. I'm just just like they did in Europe. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, what, probably the earliest explanation that we find in terms of the reason behind dipping this vegetable into water, you ready? Or it's a salt water, is so that the children will ask. This sure. is what the Bach, one of the great commentators on the Shulchan Aruch, quotes. Uh, states that the reason we dip this is so that the children will ask. And I'm going to use this as an opportunity to go on one of my soapboxes about the children asking. Um, because many of our children go to wonderful schools, they'll come to the Seder with a whole bunch of wonderful answers, like questions and answers. And I think it's crucial on Seder nights to encourage real, genuine questions. So one of the things that we do at our Seder, um, I have a big stash of candy next to me and any good question up to and including what time is it, when are we eating, whatever it is, you get a candy because hopefully, Questions are a little bit more meaningful, but the goal is to really inspire genuine curiosity and genuine asking. Um, so that's just one thought about the carpus, just as a reminder. Okay. Uh, but I did dip see the dip the candy in salt water. Dip the candy in salt water. And, yeah. Um, but I did see a beautiful idea from Rav Ramon, my favorite Haggadah, Rabbi Yosef Tzvi Ramon. Um, he suggests a beautiful idea. Of course, on state or night, we're trying to experience freedom. There are many different ways of expressing our freedom Seder nights. We recline, we drink the wine. There are obviously deeper elements to freedom more than celebration. And we really try to show that we are free people. Free people, first of all, think beyond themselves. So we begin our Seder by inviting people in to join us. But in addition, he suggests the whole idea of a vegetable dipped into salt water or vinegar, it's an appetizer. It's not so much about the salt water and people crying. It's truly an appetizer. And that's the, the, sound, that's the way it sounds like. It, that's how it have, sounds have in the earlier. Heavy old dirt. Heavy old dirt. This is not, yeah, this is not like current modern day, you know, schmort. But back in the day, a potato or a vegetable dipped in salt water, they didn't have like mishnash dressing. I mean, this is yeah. what they had. Um, and what do you do after an appetizer? The purpose of an appetizer is to whet your appetite so you eat. And what do we do? We have this appetizer and then we talk and wait for one, two, three, or four hours. Yeah. One of the greatest expressions of freedom is the fact that we are in control of ourselves. We're free to do what we want, we're free, and we are human beings. And we are able to, on the one hand, whet that appetite, and at the same time, control ourselves to say, and now I'm going to wait until I get to Shokhara. And so perhaps the idea behind this vegetable is that of beyond the children asking, is it's one of the many expressions of freedom that we are in control, and we are going to demonstrate our 
you can start by being able to hold back after having that appetizer. Yeah. One, one uh, I want to say food for thought, which is <laughs> unintentionally uh, corny. Um, one food for thought is the whole evening without free things, which is exactly what you're talking about. Um, and um, the ability to express self-control is an expression of freedom. Um, I also think it's weird that the first expression of freedom is dipping something delicious in something not delicious. Um, you don't right? like potatoes and salt water? I love potatoes and salt water, but um, it, it, it has a negative connotation. It, it, it has it. a negative connotation. Yeah. Right? Dipping has such a like, freedom oriented, like, you have dips and spreads on your table. Right. Um, dip in hummus, I mean, don't dip in hummus, but it's kit reference to fitness. Right. Don't do not dip it in the hummus, <laughs> not in dogs. Uh, unless you're sweaty. Um, dip it, in, dip it in, in some tasty, delicious dip to start off the evening. So it always strikes me that we start off by taking an act of freedom um, and kind of smothering it in, 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 in non-freedom, right. in, in tears. One of the many dichotomies of the Seder. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. Um, all right, next, we're going to talk about Kadesh or Chatz Karpas Yachatz. A little about Yachatz. Yachatz, um, yachatz is bizarre. Why is Yachatz bizarre? We have three matzahs. There's an interesting conversation about there's a minhag to have four matzahs. Um, that would be a little highlight of something we may share um, maybe on the second day of Pesach. You won't be there. <laughs> um, I can tell you afterwards. Um, there are three matzahs, and um, we spend a lot, we exert a lot of effort to make sure that our chalot, in general, are shalom, are whole. Um, so you can't use a, a bread that's ripped for lecha mishnah on Shabbat, right? You can't use it as one of the two chalas that we use if it's ripped or it's torn. And here, before we, like hours before we get to matzah, before we've even thought about eating this matzah, before, the first thing we do is we break, we break the matzah in half. Um, my grandfather was a mathematician um, and a very bright mathematician. would always break it, break the matzah and would say, which half is bigger? <laughs> and our kid would be like, that half is bigger every year. And he was like, technically the whole thing is incorrect because neither of these are halves, whatever. You have to be a German mathematician to appreciate that joke. Um, so the question is, if we so value completeness and we express that in having our chal is complete and, and you can't make the bracha if the chal is not complete, the question is, why do we straight away break the middle matzah? So there are a lot of answers. Lechem Oni, right? It's poor man's bread, um, and a poor man never eats their entire meal, right? They always save meat, a piece of the meal for later, um, which is why we hide it away. Um, I want to suggest uh, another beautiful idea that I found. One of the things I hope we can do is highlight some Haggadahs. Um, Baruch Hashem, um, I went into Shabzis, which is the the Jewish bookstore in Baltimore, um, and Yitzi, who's the seller in Shabzis, very confusing, um, Yitzi told me there's 25 new Haggadahs this year, at least. So it's a special time to be alive. Um, one of the best new Haggadahs, which is coming up backwards, is this Haggadah by Rabbi Shmuel Dolden. Rabbi Dolden was the rabbi um, of a shul in Englewood for 30 years, um, and he wrote this Haggadah called Unlocking the Haggadah. Uh, it's awesome. It's really, really wonderful. So he suggests that the reason one of the first things we do is, um, is breaking the middle matzah is to remind us that the story is not complete, right? So we take the matzah, we break it, and we hide part of the matzah away to all the way to the end of the Seder to understand that Yitziah and Tzrayim, the story of the Exodus, was the beginning of the Jewish nation. It was the beginning of our story. Um, and the combination of that story is when the Sheaf comes, is when Utopia comes to the world, when there's peace and harmony in the world, when everyone knows God and everyone is, everyone gets along. So from the get-go, we set the expectation in the story that this is not a story of history, but this is a living story. This is a story that we are very, very much part of. And we, we literally break the, 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 the protagonist, that's the main character, we break the protagonist of the story in half to show that the story is not complete, right. which is why the last step in the Haggadah is called Nirtzah. Nirtzah is from the language of Ratzon, which is desire. Um, and the last thing we do, the first thing we do at the Haggadah is we express a desire for redemption and we understand that this is a living story. And the last thing we do at the Haggadah is Nirtzah, is we, we express a desire to, to complete the story, to, to re-bring the matzah together. And that's why the last thing we taste at the Seder 
is the matter. I told it's beautiful. If, yeah. I could, if I can interject, I mean, Please. there there is you know a lot of philosophy around what makes a person complete. So a lot of debates among Jewish philosophers, and uh, one of my favorite Hasidic strands of, of thinking, streams of thinking, is that of Ishvitz and Ratzavik, and in, in many much of the writing they talk about the the rest of the desire is the highest level, meaning that is kind of where you max out to, mm -hmm. to accept that and acknowledge that, but that is the, the complete amount. I, I shared in, in Shul on Shabbos morning, to, to give us what we have a private conversation for a second, <laughs> I shared in Shul Shabbos morning that Rav Cook um, once said that there's only one thing, B'nai Chutzla, it's only one thing that Jews in that diaspora have over B'nai Eretz Yisrael, over the people who live in Israel. It's only one thing that we have, assuming no one is up in the middle of the night listening in Israel. Um, the one thing we have is the desire to live in Israel. Beautiful. There's the rats on to live in Israel. Once you live in Israel, so, you don't have the desire, it's so, there. So, um, so I said that the, sending the, 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 uh, the satellite to the moon, mm -hmm. at least we still have the that's, desire that's, to do that's, that. That's, that's um, okay. Such an important thought. Such an important thought. Beautiful. All right. Um, Holach Ma'anya. We're going to dive straight into the next section of the Haggadah. Um, so Holach Ma'anya. What are you talking about next? Mother and Jenna. So we're going to do Halak Ma'anya, and then Rabbi Moulton will have, um, will, will give us a structure, more detailed thought on the structure of what we're, what we're doing. Halak Ma'anya is the introductory passage, right? It's the invitation, Halak Ma'anya to An Yisrael. Hold on, let me open it up and get the whole language correct. What's unusual about Halak Ma'anya is we've done all of these ceremonial pieces, right? We've done, we've dipped, and we've prayed, and we've shakiyanud. Um, and then before we get into Sikha Yitzhiya Sinsrayim, before we get into the story of the Exodus, we start off by extending the invitation. So this translates as following. This is the bread of affliction that our forefathers ate in the land of Egypt. Whoever is hungry, let him come and eat. Whoever is in need, let him come and observe the Passover, Passover ritual. This year we are here. Next year may we be in the land of Israel. This year we are slaves. Next year we may be free people. So the famous question on Halach Ma'anya is why is it written in Aramaic? Right? Two questions on Halach Ma'anya. It's the only section of the Haggadah that's written in Aramaic, not written in the Hebrew. That's question number one. Question number two is... I'll remember question number two in a second. Oh, there's no source for Halach Ma'anya. This is the primary source for this language. There's nowhere in the Talmud that writes Halach Ma'anya. There's nowhere in the Midrashim. Sages don't source Halach Ma'anya. The only place you're going to find this invitation, this language, is right here in Haggadah. So the question is, what's going on? The Chassam Sofer. No. The Chassam Sofer. Sorry, I have his Haggadah right over there. The Chassam Sofer quotes a sefer called Maasei Hashem. The Maasei Hashem places the authorship of this paragraph at the first year after the destruction of the Beit Hamikdash. Why? What's the significance in the first year after the destruction of the Beit Hamikdash? It's the first year that the Jewish people were not bringing the Korban Pesach, and the halacha, the rule by the Korban Pesach was you had to extend an invitation in advance, you had to be in the room, you had to lock the door, and you couldn't come and go. It had to be solidified who was there and who was staying and who was found there. So the first year, as an act of lamentation, they point out, this year we can invite whoever we want. We can come and go as we want, right? We have no current pass up this year. So I can leave, I can go next door, I can come in, I can go out, I can extend the invitation. Look, we're ready during the Seder. I can invite whoever we want. And it's an act of very subtle lamentation, which, which explains entirely why it's a strange place for us to start. Lashana Habar Ba'ar Yisrael. And we do that at the end. We sing, we're drunk, we, we party at the end. Next year we'll be in Jerusalem, please God. Why do we start with a prayer of next year in Jerusalem? So the Chasm Sofer, uh, through the Maasei Hashem, suggests that this was a lamentation to start off. This was the first thing the Jews who were exiled from Jerusalem, they would start off as a, as a token, as a note. Right? How weird it must have been, how strange it must have been to bring the carbon Pesach one year, to have all of those halachot in place one year, and then the next year, not to have your house smelling of roasted meat um, and to not be together in Jerusalem. How tragic it must have been to sit around that Seder table. And this was their expression of that tragedy. This was the note that we are, we are free to invite whoever we want. That's the idea of Halakhmah. Okay, Rabbi Motsin. 
All right. Okay. So let's talk about Magid in a very general global sense. I have always been very troubled by Magid. I like structure. I like things when, when I understand the sequence of why this comes first, this comes second. And um, Magid always just seemed like a hodgepodge of a bunch of verses and songs kind of thrown together. Lift your cup up now, cover the follow, lift your cup up. It's just, it seemed chaotic. Um, yeah. Exactly. And of course, it's state or night, which means it's a night of order, of structure. And so something seemed off over here, and I knew I was missing something. And so I'm going to go back to my favorite Haveda for a moment, and that is Rebbe Ramon, where he does us the amazing favor. Uh, is it okay if I quote the same person twice? Yeah, of course. I plan on doing it. Great. So he does something phenomenal. Um, he organizes the section of Magi, this very large section. I'm going to go through it with you. And one piece of background idea to keep in mind, Rav Soloveitchik says that, you know, we have the mitzvah of remembering the Exodus every single day, day and night, really. What makes Seder night different? And his answer is that on Seder night, in addition to remembering the Exodus, we have an obligation to thank God for it as well. It's not just a memory, but it's going to be a memory expressed through our emotions as we thank Hashem for the fact that we are free. So with that in mind, what you're going to see, I think is amazing, uh, it's a structure of Magid. As we'll see, it's going to follow a very clear and consistent sequence. Question, answer, praise. Four times, and each time, as we'll see, we'll come back to, it's going to have a different angle or different theme. Okay? So bear with me. Magid section begins with the most famous of questions, and that is the Manishtana, the four questions. Okay? Immediately after those four questions, they're answered with a passage, Avadim Hayinu, the Pharaoh of the Mitzrayim, we were slaves to Pharaoh, and God has freed us, which really answers the four questions if you read through it carefully. Immediately after that section, we say thank you. We say, Baruch HaMakom Baruch Hu, which is really, those are words of praise. We're thanking God, praising God. Boom. Section number one, okay? We'll come back to what the different themes are in a moment. Maybe think about that as I go through this. Second section, Chachamahu Omer, what does the wise one say? And these are the questions asked by the four sons, or one of them doesn't really ask. Okay, as we go on, immediately after those questions, we go on to the answers. Which again is an answer to those questions. We talk about the fact that our forefathers were idolaters, and then God brought us to Sinai, where we served him. And then immediately after that, we have praise. Baruch Shomer HaFakas of Yisrael. We praise. Okay, I will speak up. So immediately afterwards, we thank God. Baruch Shomer HaFakas of Yisrael. We thank God for keeping his promise and taking us out of Egypt. Once again, those are words of praise, thanking God, singing to God. Third section, Ma Bikesh Lavan Harami Lasos, which this is a really long section where we go through uh, quite a few verses explaining and describing um, the story of Yitzhiyat Mitzrayim, of the Exodus, and those are the questions. We answer it with those verses, say ulamad, and we have verse after verse after verse, and that section finishes with our favorite song, which is Dai Dai Nenu. Okay, again, praise finishing that section, and the final section, Matzah Zushon Ochlim Al Shuma. why do we eat this matzah, why do we eat the marar, another question, answered by the statements of Rabban Gamliel, Pesach, Matzah, Umarar, these are the different things that we eat, and that finishes with Therefore, we are obligated to praise God again, praise. First of all, cool. Question, answer, praise, question, answer, praise, question, answer, praise, and a fourth time. Each one has a bit of a different theme because, of course, on Seder night, one of the things we're trying to do is describe the same story from different angles and really connect to different people who the story speaks to them in different ways. So if you read through the story, these sections closely, the first time around, we're focusing on the physical redemption. We were slaves, now we're free. Second time around, we were idolaters, now we stood, then we stood at Sinai. It's more about the spiritual redemption, a completely different angle or dimension to the a a idea of freedom. The third time around is for all of you textual learners, people who like doing things in the analytical fashion. We describe the story again, this time not in a brief format, but rather we dig deep, we go really deep into the verses and explain it on an intellectual level. The last time, for all you visual learners, Pesach, Matzah, Mara, we're pointing to the different items at our Seder plates, uh, at, our, at our Pesach Seder, in order to once again say the story, but again from a completely different angle. And amazingly, the Seder has Seder, the section of Magid actually is quite structured. Completely speculative? Yeah. I wonder if you can apply each section to a different strategy or approach to one of the children, the Chacham, Rasha. Mm. 
Tom and Shaina Yudeva, Shaina Yudeva Shaw. Right, that's Tom. Yeah, um, for all the educators yeah. who keep on texting us uh, that we should speak louder. Um, I wonder if, um, yeah, I wonder if you could apply the different methodologies in learning and inspiring um, to the different Chacham Rasha Tom people, Shaina Yudeva Shaw. Okay, you have a master of Rabbi Eliezer. Okay, this is going to take me a few, just a few moments to unpack. There's a story of Rabbi Akiva. We're all familiar with that story. Uh, all these great rabbis are sitting together at Rabbi Akiva's house in the Nebra. And many of the commentators who are well-versed in geography ask, why are they in the Nebra? Rabbi Akiva is the one who lives in the Nebra, and all the other sages at his seder are actually his teachers. Yeah. Okay, so why is Rabbi Akiva the, the student? at the house of his, why are the teachers at the house of the students? That's the question that's asked. Um, some historians speculate that there's this, this takes place during a time of great persecution by the hands of the Romans, and it could be that the cities that the other stages were living in, um, they weren't able to celebrate Pesach properly in such a setting, and therefore they go to B'nai Brak, who's much quieter, um, and that's why they're there, okay. One possibility. Another possibility, and maybe to understand this possibility, I'm going to take a step back. I want to share with you something that I've been thinking about a lot recently, um, I think you'll be able to appreciate, and that is a tension that is a growing tension between young and old. There's always a tension between young and old. Um, I recently read some stats that, that demonstrate that the bigger divide in our country right, right now is not between those to the right and those to the left, but actually between young and old, okay, which is fascinating. Yeah. Um, okay. In Judaism, there's also a tension in, in this regard. Um, there are two seminal moments in, in Judaism, which I think define us as Jews. One is the Exodus slash standing, standing at Sinai, the moment of revelation where God appears to us, speaks to us, and lays out exactly what we need to do. And on the other side, we have Mashiach, the Messianic era, which we have yet to experience, but also certainly defines us. Now, it depends on which poll you're looking at or which perspective you're taking, it will impact how we look at ourselves. If we're looking at it from the perspective of Sinai, then we have probably the most famous statements, something known as Yurida Agoros, the idea that with each generation as we go on, we're further, we further and further away. There are many Talmudic statements to this effect that we are, we don't have that same clarity. They heard from God. We're just, you know, there's some broken telephone. We're, we're so far removed from that. Down. The passed down, passed down, things get yeah. lost. On the other hand, from the other perspective, the perspective of Mashiach, there's something that you find in some writings, the writings of Rilke Cook and others, there's the notion of alias hadoros. There's the idea that as time goes on, we're actually getting closer and closer to the Messianic era. And there's this incredible tension between these two, right? And we yeah. see it all the time. We're not going to get into any practical examples, but there's this tension between the old and the new, not just in age, but in terms of perspectives in life and do things need to change and how they change. And as Jews, we try to balance these two ideas. And I was talking about this and sharing this with uh, Rabbi Howard, a local rabbi here, and he suggested that that's exactly what's going on in the story with Rabbi Akiva. He says these older sages are, and everyone at the time, and this is a time of great unrest, great tumult in, in the Jewish people. They recognize that for things to be able to pass on, we need on the one hand the accumulated wisdom of the old, of our traditions, of those amazing traditions, and at the same time that has to be bridged with the new. Rabbi Akiva being the student, and he's also not just the student, he is the young of hearts. We know that he is able to turn his life around at, at not a young age at all, right? He is the man who has these unbelievable wellsprings of creativity, of, of freshness, of vigor. He's a youth to the core, right? Whenever they, the sages in the Talmud, they always encounter these tragic moments where Akiva is always the one who doesn't look at the past. He's hopeful. He sees the future, exactly. Yeah. And they're at this data right now. They recognize they have to go to Rabbi Akiva. In order for the tradition to get passed on, they have to go to the future and speak to him to ensure that the traditions of old will be able to be filtered down with their adaptations, with those minute changes to be appropriate to the new era. And that's what's going on in that section. And then, and then this is the most beautiful part. The poetic end of that section is what? The Talmudim oh, yeah, come, well, okay. the Talmudim, I'm sorry, the Talmudim come, the students come, he gives, my he gives my Krishma. But at the end of that moment, the whole purpose of that moment was to ensure that there is the Messiah, that the tradition gets passed on. At the end of the story, it's successful. The students are there. We're ready. We're ready to accept God. We're ready to take us into the future. The students are ready to pass on that torch. I, I, I mentioned this in Shalom Shabbos. One of my big questions about this passage is why the students aren't there at the Seder. Right. Right. So one one of these suggested answers is they can't they can't fulfill the mitzvah of the Hasidah. They can't lean in front of the rabbin. 
they go home, they have Seder with their families, and they and then they come back to to. I, there's a lot more to say about about that passage. It's an awesome passage. So if I if I could just maybe one uh, practical, I'll tell you one other thing yes. about one other thing about that passage. There's also no source for it in the Talmud. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. not sourced in the Talmud. It's not sourced in the Midrashim. The primary source for that story is a Tosefta that that places the story the story not in Bnei Barak but in Lod, and it takes mm-hmm. out all of the personalities and puts Rabbi Gamliel there. Um, and they don't go to say Kriyashma. They're interrupted by a rooster. Mm. So wow. it's completely, it's wow. basically completely different. There's no source for that story, wow. except the other. Yeah, sorry. Well, okay, no, so just, I mean, that, that's the big idea. But on, on a practical level, I think it also um, should impact and, and frame how we're going to engage in the Seder. Because as you mentioned, you asked me earlier what that, my favorite memory is. My favorite memory was not my uncle dressing up as Elio and Navi coming through the door. It wasn't, you know, the, the plague boxes and things like that, which are all important. But I think there's this bridging between on the one hand, being very much focused on the children, but if we're only focused on the children and, and we're not experiencing the Seder in a real way yeah. and, and taking a, a real adult perspective to the Seder, that's my fondest. My fondest memories are looking up, not always following, but trying to tap into something real that was going on in my Seder. And, you know, it goes both ways. We have to focus on the kids, but we have to also be experiencing the Seder in a real way. The Octorov, who I'm blanking on his name, he wrote a book called The Oil of Yisrael. Heschel. 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 Yeah. He was a he was a he was a grandfather, his grandfather yeah. Abraham Joshua Heschel. The Optor Rav makes the case that um, people in general, but especially children, are so much more susceptible to spiritual confusion on the Seder night, which is a great segue into the next um, the next section, which is the, the Arba Banim, the four sons. Um, I don't want to talk about the Arba Banim, um, except that. Um, except that to note um, they're not opposite of each other. Just note that the Chacham is not the opposite of the Rasha. The opposite of the Rasha is a Tzadik, right? So don't think that we're outlining four, four children that are opposite from each other. Uh, we're, we're outlining four different children, four different learners. Um, and there's actually not much difference between the Chacham and the Rasha in the end of the day. Um, it's just their, their appetite to learn, their appetite to listen is really the difference. Before we get to the to the four children, um, we start off that section. Um, in my family, we sing Baruch Hamakom, Baruch Hamakom, Baruch Hamakom, Right? We sing that song. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's not my strongest um, talent. Um, it's much easier once you've had a cup of wine. I'll tell you. Um, so the question is, why do we start? Why do we before we engage in figuring out what kind of children are at the seder table um, and what kind of learners are sitting around our table? We say Baruch HaMakam Baruch Hu. Why do we start off with the blessing of, uh, of God should bless us, we should bless God. Uh, Baruch Shinasan Torah La'amal Yisrael. Right? God gave us the Torah. What, why is the, the, the differentiation of education for our children started off with the blessing um, uh, and recognition of God and, and the Torah he gave us? He gave us? And I, I think it's a very simple answer um, because the way to educate, the way to reach the next generation um, is with the perspective that they're a blessing. Um, is with the perspective that what we have um, is a bracha. Baruch, right? All too often, so often, especially when it comes to Pesach, we feel the burden, we feel the exhaustion with the scrubbing and the toothpicks and the, uh, and the, uh, and the deep cleaning. And, and there's a, a, a sense of exhaustion once we get to the Seder night. Um, and, we, and before we start educating, before we start figuring out what kind of children are at the table, we have to pause, we have to take a deep breath and say, what we have, the values and the ideas um, and the morality that we have through the Torah that God has given us it is fundamentally a blessing. We're not, we're not trying to guilt our children into this. We're not trying to guilt anyone, anyone into it. We're not trying to force anyone to, into it. If our perspective is, Baruch HaMakam, Baruch Hu, Baruch HaMakam, Torah, Yisrael, if our perspective is what we're doing is a blessing, then um, our children will approach it. Um, a very, very particular way. Um, I'm going to move on because we're running out of time. I'll move on fairly quickly to the 10 plagues um, and, and specifically Makas Bechoros. I mentioned this on Shamas, but I'm going to repeat it again because I think it's a, a really powerful idea. And I wasn't there. And you weren't there. Thank you. Everyone else, I'm sure, was. <laughs> um, the, 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 uh, the call sign of the Jewish home during Makas Bechoros was the blood on the doorposts. 
right? Which is, if you think about it, it's pretty gruesome. I right? taking, excuse me, taking some hyssop and putting blood on the post. And the question is, what's that all about? Um, right? You're going to say to me, ah, God needed to some way to know which homes were Jewish. Okay, I, I, it's nice, but it, it's God, right? I think He can He can figure that one out. Um, to the Al Shech Hakadosh, which is one of the classic um, and fairly difficult commentaries on the Torah, um, says very simply that the Jewish home at that moment becomes like a mizbeach. What does that mean? We have in the middle of the Jewish home the carbon. We have the carbon pesach. When you brought a carbon to the base of Migdash, one of the actions that they did was they would take the blood of the carbon and they would put it on the corner of the corner of the mizbeach, and that was a sanctification of the mizbeach. And then they would take the carbon and put the carbon on top of the mizbeach. So the the message, the value of understanding that our homes um, become um, become the place where we connect with God, right? On the Seder night, it is profound. It's literally painted on the walls for us to understand um, so deeply, profoundly that our home becomes the epicenter of the mikdash of the temple on the Seder night. Yeah. Can I interject? Yeah. I, I just want to say that same idea just a tiny bit differently. Yeah. I was thinking about this this past Shabbos, and I shared this with. Those of my show who are not on this call. <laughs> so, um, but you know, thinking about it, it's I think it's the other way around. Yeah. I mean, it's not that the our house, you know, there's all these ideas about, you know, we were the kids all, we want to be like the Kohen Gadal, and we, you know, they're washing our hands like the Kohanim, you know, and so we're doing all these things to imitate what went on in the base of Mikdash in the temple. It's the other way around. The first base of Mikdash, oh, the first temple good. is our home. Very good. Home. And it is, it always is. Show is, let's be honest. It's secondary. The home is, is where Jesus is at, right? Everything and so we just go to recharge, but the home is really the true base of what, what you're just to sharpen that point, the what you're what I think you're saying is um, this is what we did in our homes. And the mikdash is recreating Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Right? The base of mikdash yeah. was recreating right. that experience exactly. of sitting around the table, having the carbon in the middle, having the blood on the doorposts. And the, the other point I want to make about that um, is the moment of the carbon Pesach is a very unique moment because when they had the carbon Pesach, they were all locked into their their homes. Um, and there's this beautiful imagery where the, the, the Gemara talks about the fact that they were bursting. There were so many people. They had eaten so much meat. It was like, it was reaching the point of gross. There was no air conditioning. Um, it, was, it was Egypt. It was Egypt. Or, or, or I'm specifically talking about Jerusalem, right? There's three million Jews in Jerusalem. There's like, seven, it's like the west side of Manhattan. There's like 75 people at your Seder that you have no idea who they are. Everyone's eating, everyone's like full and singing and kind of drunk, um, and you're locked in. And the moment you, the moment you unlock the door is when you finish consuming the, the uh, Koran Pesach. And the, the Gemara hints to the fact that they were so desperate to get out that they would go up on the roofs, because we know Jerusalem has flat roofs, so they would go up on the roofs to sing hollow, mm. which is such a magnificent imagery. Can you imagine two o'clock in the morning on Pesach night with the base of English in the background, the entire of Kal Yisrael wow. standing on the roofs of their homes in Jerusalem, all singing together, but say, it's the Yisrael and the Mitzrayim. It's this gorgeous. So what, what's the transition? The transition is the, is the doorposts. They're all walking out through those doorposts, through the blood on the doorposts. Now, they didn't do that in Jerusalem, but the doorposts represent that transition from being a family, it's being a nation. Mm. And that's constantly, that's constantly the tension in Egypt. In Egypt, we went down as a family, we became a nation. We have to be reminded that we're still a family, but we have to be reminded we're still a nation. There's that, you know, yeah. constant tension between being a nation um, and being a family. Let's move on, because we're, we're over time already. So right. thank you for your <laughs> indulgence. Um, okay, do you want to speak about matzah? I'm gonna okay. skip that. Um, sure. Okay, well, just, just a thought. It really goes back to the, the previous thoughts. A well-known idea, but I think it's an important one to think about, something I try to think about. And you mentioned about cleaning up. You know, there, there are all these metaphors, which all of our sources are replete with, but about chametz representing our sins and trying to cleanse these things. We're not really thinking about that as we're getting down and scrubbing, <laughs> but we could and we should, right? I, I, you know, was, cleaning up is, is trendy these days, right? There's a whole yeah. Netflix uh, show, a series on that. Mm-hmm. Marie, uh, Marie Kondo, right? Yeah. Uh, but but the idea is that there's something spiritual about cleaning. So this is fun. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> so, um, but the idea is that that just like 
in the lead up, in theory, and it's much more challenging, obviously, and stressed in the lead up to Pesach, but to perhaps inject a personal element. It's not expressed. You don't, you don't talk about it with others, but, but we all have some chamek that we're trying to get rid of. And then on Seder night, where I think it is a lot more practical, Matzah at its core speaks about freedom, how we're breaking free from, in our own personal redemption. The Ramchal, Ramosha Chaim Mitzato, one of the great Jewish mystics, speaks to the fact that on that night, we, there's a certain energy of Geula that we're able to tap into. And so if you want to make your Seder just a little bit more meaningful and very personal, but it'll, it'll, it'll impact your entire Seder, is to take a moment before, between now and then, and think about what we as individuals need to break free from, and just to keep that in the back of your mind as you experience the Seder, I, I think it makes all the difference. Again, that's not an idea, that's not, it's not a talking point, but it's something which is just in the, in the forefront of the back of your mind, back mindset. of your mind, the mindset. And certainly the matzah represents it in, in, in its most specific sense, the idea of freedom and specifically the transition from lechem oni, the poor man's bread, into uh, the, the, the bread of freedom. Um, there's the transition within the matzah. So as we see the matzah and we continue to see the matzah and finally eat the matzah, experience that, perhaps just something to keep in the back of our mind um, during that time. Um, well, uh, know, just, yeah, just, no, it's yeah, good just, I'll just share one, one idea from Rabbi Tversky. Um, is this uh, this is uh, Rabbi Dr. Tversky who suggests the following idea. He points out that the order is a little off. We should first eat the marah and then we should have the matzah. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so he points out, and his background is in addictions and, and people struggling with different issues. He points out that so often we, you know, Mara represents the, the hardships, the difficulties, the, the, the bad things in our life. And matzah, again, represents the freedom. So often it's only after we are free that we're actually able to look back and say, oh my, I was struggling with so much. I wasn't even, I was so steeped in whatever it is that I was stuck in that I wasn't even aware of all that terrible, whatever it was that was surrounding me. So we first need to perhaps break free. And on a practical level, sometimes we're so stuck in our, in our beating ourselves up or whatever negative behavior or negative patterns. And sometimes we just have to stop, go forward. And then we've taken a few steps, a few leaps forward. We can look back and start to work through that mara. But until we really break free, sometimes it's not as sequential, as an orderly, ironically, as it's supposed to be, we need to just break free, and then once we're in a free and good state, we're in a better state of mind, that's when we could turn back and do our chuba. That's when we could turn back and see all the mara that was in our lives. The Monday morning quarterbacking, which I think is a legitimate phrase. Monday morning quarterbacking, quarterbacking our office. Yes, beautiful. beautiful. Um, okay. Um, Are you a football fan? No. Okay. <laughs> that's why I was like, <laughs> not really sure what I was saying. Um, the last idea. Um, and, and if there's anything you want to share afterwards, um, I'll be happy to give you the last word. The last idea I, I want to talk about uh, tonight is the uh, the unusual chorus when we when we combine matzah and mara together uh, to eat it in a sandwich. We're not even being we're not even fulfilling the 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 opi- right, it's opinion of Hillel that you have to eat matzah and mara together. We're not even fulfilling that opinion um, because we say zeich lamikdash to Hillel. Right, it's a, it's a, it's a, a zeicher. It's a, it's a memorial. a memorial to Hillel's opinion. But we don't pass him like that opinion, especially if you don't have the carbon pesach. We definitely don't pass him like like that opinion. So we're not fulfilling any, we're not fulfilling any particular opinion. We're just, we're just invoking opinion. Um, I think the reason, one of the reasons we do, one of the suggestions why we eat this matzah mar sandwich, and is because matzah mar had a similarity. What's a similarity? The similarity is time. Why do we use lettuce for Mara commonly? There are plenty of people who don't, but I think one of the most widespread observations is to use lettuce. It's because lettuce is not particularly bitter, the lettuce starts off bitter, right? When lettuce is young or immature or not ripe, whatever the right word is for lettuce, for young lettuce, um, it's bitter. And as it grows and as it develops, uh, I feel like I'm talking to a child. As the, ma- as the Mara develops, it becomes sweet. Um, the lettuce becomes sweet. Um, and and matzah is the inverse of that, right? As the matzah ages, as the matzah, as we wait longer and longer with the bread, the matzah becomes less kosher. It's the point that after 18 minutes, it's not matzah anymore, it's comments. So when you put the, the two inverses together, um, you you begin to realize that nothing is nothing is that simple, right? Some people grow over time and some people don't grow over time. and and, and the, the, uh, the self-awareness um, and looking back at Jewish history, as we relive the first moments of Jewish history, um, we've had times when the Jewish people are on the sunnah, right? The times where 
were getting sweeter and it started off with bitterness and it ended up in the state of Israel and ended up with Israel sending a satellite to the moon. Um, and there are times when we had everything we needed. We had the shtetl and it was a beautiful Jewish life uh, and it came to a, a terrible crushing pull. And that's the, the balance when you're starting off Jewish history on the, the Pesach night, you have to know able to able that there are both of those experiences. I'll take this idea one step further. This is commemorating the opinion of Hila. So this is my this is my Kiddush for the year. You tell me if you like it. If you don't like it, well, log off and you'll tell me. Uh, my Kiddush for the year is there's a famous story of, I think it was a Ger, I think it's a Ger or a girl, I'm not sure, comes to Shammai and says, teach me the Torah on one foot. And Shammai says, you're like, teach you the Torah on one foot? You're a ridiculous human being. I can't do that. So he leaves, he leaves Shammai very de- dejected. Then he goes to Hillel and says, teach me the Torah on one foot. What does Hillel say? Hillel says, right? you should love your neighbor like you love yourself, and everything else is coming true. What's the, the Hebrew for on one foot? Al regal achat. Regal achat, regal is also the Hebrew for chag. Right? We call the, we call the, three, the three vessels, Sukkot, Shavuot, and Pesach, we call them regalim, or aliyah the regal, because everyone used to walk up to Jerusalem. So Hillel is saying, teach me our regal achat, what's the point of Pesach? What's the point of Sukkot? What's the point of Shavuot? Our regal achat, what's the point of each of these, each of these chagim, is behalf of the regal Everything else is coming true. Right? All the other stuff you do, all the other learning and the and the eating and the and the all the other stuff, all the other mitzvahs, mitzvahs that right are very, very important. But if you don't walk away from Pesach loving someone more, if you don't walk away thinking about how you can love your fellow Jew more, then you miss the entire point. The point of sitting around the Seder with your family, the point of being shul over Pesach, the point in going to the park on Pesach, the point of share, going on Tiolim, going on trips during Kalamoy, the point of being all the regalim, a regal achat, the point of each and every regal is to teach the author of Kanoka, is to bring the matzah and mara together, to bring those Jews who are working on the way up, those Jews who are maybe not working on the way up, who are got a bit going in the opposite direction, and to not see the difference between the bitter Jews and the happy Jews, not see the difference between the matzah and the mara, but ultimately to have the author of Kanoka. Beautiful. That was my, my thought for, the, for, uh, for this year. Any, yeah. fun, any final thoughts? That was, I, I can't, I can't, uh, can't add anything to that. That was beautiful. Chag uh, to all. Chag you. Okay. Chag Thank, Thank you so much um, to over 20, 25 of you who logged in. Um, this was awesome that it worked. Um, and uh, we would obviously love to hear if you had any thoughts or any feedback. Um, we're going to have the video available as well uh, so we can share that out. Um, and if you have any reactions or ideas to share, uh, please don't hesitate to, to email me or, or text me or call me, um, and I'll send you Rabbi Motzi's way. Um, he's not working on, on the first days of Pesach, so he has all the time in the world. Um, and uh, everyone should have a Chag Kasha V'Sameach again. Thank you, Rabbi Motzi, uh, for joining us this evening. Uh, thank you, everyone, for spending the time, for logging in. Um, and uh, it should be a good, uh, inspiring, and a very special Pesach together. Have a good evening.